Looking into your Bible, we're at Psalm 51 this morning. That's on page 520 of your Pew Bible. I, I, I love the Olympic season. I have a lot of great memories. I, I missed a lot of Olympics being in Africa most of the last uh, two decades. But I look forward to kind of watching a lot this uh, the next two weeks with my mother. She's uh, in her elder years. She'll be 87 next month. And uh, we'll be spending a lot of time together in a special way that I remember from the 70s and 80s, watching, uh, watching the Olympics as a family. There are 150 uh, Psalms in the book of Psalms, and half of them are attributed to David. Some Psalms are born out of elation and joy and worship and triumph. And there are other Psalms that, uh, like Psalm 51, are born out of deep pain and anguish and chastisement and rebuke. You know, that shattered feeling when you've just been put in your place. That, that crushed feeling when you're facing the consequences of a very poor decision. Well, Psalm 51 was written by David in such a state. Now, spiritually, this can be a great and powerful place to be. For when we're stripped of our pretensions, we have, we're, there's nowhere to hide. We come to God in honesty, and we ask for his grace, and he gives it. So before we go any further, let me just uh, pray a short prayer for us to get started. Lord, I ask you, Lord, to show me and help me preach and teach your word accurately. I pray that you would open our hearts, open our ears to what you would have us to learn this beautiful morning. We praise you and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, King David the most famous and renowned of all Israel's kings, made a huge mistake that he never lived down. He was a mighty warrior, the slayer of Goliath when he was a, child, when he was a boy. He was a brave and able leader, both on the military battle scene and also in civic life. He was a musician. He was a poet. He was a man after God's own heart. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And the Bible says that he did not fail to keep all of the Lord's commands all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. And I'm going to tell you that story in condensed form from 1 Samuel 11 and 12. And it begins in the spring at the time when kings go off to war. David sent Joab, his commander, out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Now, we are not told why he stayed while his whole army was in battle with an important nearby foe, but there is a hint. In the previous chapter, we are told that the Israelite army defeated these same Ammonites and chased them back into their walled city of Rabbah, their capital, which is today Amman, Jordan. And rather than attempt a long siege over the wet winter months, they came back the next spring to finish the job. Having routed them before, the king clearly chose to sit this one out. And this decision would carry huge ramifications. Idle hands are the devil's workshop, his son Solomon would write in the next generation in the book of Proverbs. One evening, the king was strolling on his palace roof. Now, Jerusalem of that day was small and houses were stacked together. The palace was at the highest point and from there, he spotted a beautiful young woman bathing. Now, the fact that men are aroused by sight and that sexual attraction is a very powerful force should not in itself be scandalous. For these are both by design by the God who made us sexual beings. 
But any man will tell you that the first glimpse is unavoidable, be it on a billboard or a computer screen or across the room, but usually it's that second lingering glance that gets us in trouble, that churns the desires of the heart. In the throes of idleness, David's self-control was weak. He sent someone to identify her. Isn't this Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam and wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now, Uriah was no ordinary man, but one of David's elite soldiers, a Navy SEAL, an Army Green Beret, fearless unto death with unusual fighting prowess. But no matter, get me that woman, he demanded. He slept with her, for no one refused the king, and she went home. And a short while later, she sent him the news that she was pregnant. And like most men who hear those words from a woman, not his wife, he panicked and then he plotted to cover up this unfortunate fact. Recalling Uriah from the field of battle, the king tried many ways to soften this mighty warrior so that he would go home and sleep with his wife. And time was of the essence. First, the king asked for a debrief. How are the men doing? How is the battle going? And then he said, go home and wash your feet to the travel-weary, dust-covered Uriah. Now, the king sent behind him a gift to his home. And the Bible doesn't say what that gift was, but I imagine it to be a lavish meal with wine and candles and fragrances. But the plan failed. Uriah did not go home, but slept outside the entrance of the palace with the other servants. And when asked why, Uriah responded that while his fellow soldiers were encamped outside in the sacrifice of battle, he would not think of whining and dining and lying with his wife. The king then invited him for a sumptuous meal and got Uriah drunk. But Uriah still did not go home, but instead slept outside the palace again. This warrior could not be compromised. More drastic measures were required to cover up the truth. Now the king sent Uriah back to the battlefield carrying his own death warrant. In the king's letter that Uriah was carrying, the king ordered the army commander to place Uriah in such a position that he would be killed in battle, and he was. A messenger came back to tell the king that your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. And after a period of mourning, David took Bathsheba to his palace to be his wife, and she bore him a son which would not survive infancy. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. So the Lord sent the royal prophet Nathan to David, and he told him this story. In a certain village, there were two men, a rich one and a poor one. And the rich man had many sheep and cattle, while the poor man had only a baby ewe lamb, whom he raised with like his children, shared his food, slept with it in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to visit the rich man, and instead of slaughtering one of his own sheep and cattle for a meal, he instead took the poor man's baby ewe lamb and prepared it for the traveler. And upon hearing this, David rose up with anger and indignation and he said, surely the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over, for he did this thing without pity. And Nathan, glaring back, said, you are that man. And he went on to say that the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I have given you, David, so much riches and wives and houses and the kingdom. If this was too little 
I would have given you more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite by the sword of the Ammonites, and now the sword will never depart from your house. For you despised me and took Uriah, the wife of Uriah, to be your own. David humbly replied to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan the prophet replied, the Lord has taken away your sin and you will not die. Now my hunch is that David wrote the original version of what we call Psalm 51 immediately after this confrontation with Nathan. A poet and a man of great expressive emotions, he likely penned this psalm when these emotions were heightened as a song of the restorative power of repentance and God's forgiveness and restoration. So let's see what Psalm 51 has to teach us. Now we'll concentrate only on the first 12 verses and there will be a movement of four parts. In the first part, the psalmist appeals to God's mercy. In the second part, he takes responsibility for his own sin. Third, he takes he asks God to cleanse him of that sin. And fourth and finally, he asks God for restoration. Let's look at these parts in greater detail and I'll give a commentary as we go along. And so the subtitle to Psalm 51 says, to the leader, a Psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. Now in part one, which is verses one and two, the psalmist appeals to God's mercy, for it is from God's character that forgiveness is found, not from any self-correction. Reading verses one and two. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. Now, as we've seen in other Psalms, to begin by acknowledging God and his character is to keep the focus on the great God who can do anything. And we would do well to follow that model. And now here the Psalmist calls upon two key characteristics of God, steadfast love and abundant mercy as the gateway for his repentance. Because only God can forgive sins and God wants to forgive sins. We cannot cleanse our own sins. Note how the psalmist asks God the same thing three separate ways. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. A repetition is poetic, but it also forms as an emphasis of the cry of his heart. And now moving on to part two, this is verses three through six, the psalmist takes responsibility for his sin. Reading three and four. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. And the psalmist now acknowledges what God has known all along, that he has sinned. And what is sin? Sin is a transgression of God's law, thinking that there is a better way than God's way. That his sin is ever before him implies to him that the consequences of his sin are eating away at his serenity. He is guilty and that weighs heavily upon him not giving him rest. And in today's terms, we might say that he is full of anxiety, but the antidote is the same. Take ownership of your own mistakes. Now in verse four, at first glance, it seems to be a rather confusing statement. Against you and you alone have I sinned. Now hasn't David sinned against Bathsheba 
and even more against the now dead Uriah? Don't sinners in every era hurt those around them? But we might look at this statement as a, as a poetic exaggeration, a hyperbole, because first and foremost, he has sinned against God, rebelling against God's provision and seeking to fulfill his needs in very selfish ways. First and foremost, he must get right with God. And so it is with us. When we sin, ultimately, we are denying trusting God's provision in our lives. And in consequence of that action, we hurt others. Since our sin is against God, God is justified in allowing the psalmist and us to experience the judgment, the consequences of our sin and rebellion. Continuing with verse five. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. And here he is not throwing his mother under the bus. He is actually taking further ownership of his sin. To be born or even to be conceived on this earth is to become a sinner automatically. John Calvin calls it a disease fixed within our nature. In other words, it is inevitable. Don't try to deny it, own it, but thank God that he has provide, provided a means to deal with sin. Continuing verse six, you desire truth in the inward being, therefore teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Deep within our own souls, we must commit to honesty and truth and awareness and integrity and candor. And this is not easy. Jesus himself says in Mark 7 that evil lurks in the heart of a person, making him or her unclean. And we must be vigilant against self-deception, which is what happens when we deny our sin over and over again, as David did. And it took Nathan coming to him to wake him up to the awful truth of what he did. But when we are consistently honest in our private lives, God converts this into wisdom. And then moving on to part three, this is verses seven to nine. The psalmist asks God to cleanse him. Reading seven, eight, and nine. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Hyssop was an herb used in cleansing rituals such as that for leprosy. And bathing of the body and washing of the clothes was a part of the purification process. But ultimately what the psalmist is getting at is that only the Lord can clean out the inner world, the heart of a person, and he can do it especially well if we let him. Then the painful, painful consequences of sin, which feel like broken bones, will have served the valuable purpose to turn us back to God to seek his mercy. Pain has a purpose. The sign of successful living is not sin management, but constantly throwing ourselves onto the grace of God. God promises to forgive our sins, though not necessarily to remove the consequences of them, as David's life makes clear. And finally, we move into part four. David asks for restoration in verses 10 to 12. And restoration is the ultimate end of and the reward for repentance. Reading verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. God is the great creator of this world, and he alone can clean a sin-sick, evil-inclined heart and make it clean. A new and right spirit or a steadfast spirit describes a newly strengthened spirit that has conviction to follow God's ways, is convinced 
that God's ways are best. Verses 11 and 12, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. And here the psalmist asks God in two similar phrases not to abandon him. Sin is so lethal because it separates us from God. The intense feeling in the midst of sin is that God may or has abandoned us and we feel unworthy and rejectable. But the truth is that God never abandons us, never has, never will. It is we who abandon him. And the psalmist asks God to restore the joy of salvation, the joy of walking with God and living his way. Now the temptation of sin for David and for us is that it promises joy outside of God's ways. And not only does it not deliver that joy, but it instead ushers in pain and guilt. We, the psalmist and us, are fooled by sin, but we learn from our mistakes. We bring those sins to God in humble repentance and God restores our joy. The good news is that confessing and repenting of sin makes us morally stronger and more resolute against future temptations to dismiss and disobey God. Everybody on earth wants a joy-filled life, but only a select few are willing to do what it takes to get it. And Psalm 51 is a model showing us how. Because we live in a sinful world, we cannot escape being stained by that sin. And inevitably, we will make mistakes. We will disobey God. We will hurt others. God's solution is rather simple to understand, if rather difficult to do. And that's to keep a line of communication open with God at all times and confess honestly to him and safe other people routinely. God loves that and it deepens our intimacy with others. Then small sins will not snowball into big ones and as only God can, our sin and brokenness will be converted into strength of character and joy of spirit. Amen. Let me pray for us for just one moment, and then I'll ask all of us to join together in the Lord's Prayer, which will be projected behind me. But let me pray for us first. Father God, we thank you for your precious word that shows in utter honesty the sins and mistakes of your servant, King David, that despite these mistakes, he was a man after your heart. And so can we be. Thank you for his repentant heart in Psalm 51 that gives hope of restoration because of your steadfast love and your great compassion. We repent and acknowledge our turning from you and seeking joy apart from you. Please cleanse us in the innermost parts. Grant us clean hearts, willing spirits, and renewed joy. We boldly seek the joy that comes from you. And now let's say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.